I've talked a lot about the dangers of so-called deliverance ministries on this channel. And that was something I got involved in right after I was saved out of new age deception. The reason I got involved with it, when you leave the new age, you often experience incredibly strong spiritual warfare for the first time consciously. And I didn't know how to deal with it. So I went into deliverance ministry and it made everything worse because it's not biblical. It twists scripture. It twists Jesus casting out demons to try to justify it. And I've been warning those who are coming out of the new age, don't get sucked in to deliverance ministry deception. Some people have to find out for themselves like I did. But the following video that's from my good friend and sister in Christ, Dawn Hill, who herself came out of deception in the new apostolic reformation, is explaining why a social media influencer, Angela Usi, who some of you may know because she was on the Daily Wire with Michael Knows, and why the fact that Angela is now promoting deliverance ministry and false teachers like Isaiah Saldivar, why this is extremely alarming to us and dangerous enough for us to put up this video. Angela, if you're watching this, I love you so much. I care about you. As you might remember, Angela, when I went on your podcast a couple of years ago, I said that new agers coming out of the new age need to watch out for deliverance ministry. And I thought you heard me then. Um, now you're ventured into this dangerous area, which I'm praying that you will leave. But because you are influencing others to go into deliverance ministry, we've got to publicly denounce what you are promoting. And we're not putting you down, Angela. We are doing this because we care about your soul. We care about the souls of the people you're influencing. And we're praying for you. So please watch this important video from Don Hill about the spiritual dangers of deliverance ministry. And I've got links in the description below for more information on this. And I remember as we're going through it, like I'm thinking to myself, like, this is wild. Like this is Yeah, you I, were saying that. Like I can't believe this yeah. is happening. What is happening? Like that's not me. Like the way like these things that are ha like that's what was that? What what is like a another voice was coming out of your mouth and then you'd be like, What was that? And right. I was like, It's okay, like this is biblical, like you're getting set free. Mm-hmm. Like how do you explain that? Like a Christian can't and literally there's another voice that's literally talking out and then leaving and then you're free like what <laughs> and didn't want to leave and it was crazy and yeah. um so this happens in the parking lot for a couple hours i go home um and so the next morning i felt that same feeling that i felt way back when i got rid of all the crystals and all the tarot cards and had a real deliverance from that without having a word for mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. it was just like that exhaustion that like yeah Oh my goodness. Um, um, when you see, you know, demons being cast out, the fruit of the spirit, um, the spirit of God, like that is a sign of a healthy, good church that if, if, if there's a church, like I would never go to a church that doesn't do deliverance personally, because at that point, your church is just a demon daycare. Ooh, right. Obviously, you have to walk in righteousness. Obviously, you can't just be a deliverance junkie trying to get deliverance every single week and then continue to sin. Yeah. That's not the goal. That's not the point. That's not the message. And that's not the gospel. And that's, that's not what we're saying. And that's what most deliverance ministers are not saying and yet are portrayed in that sense as though they undermine sin and just give all glory is what I hear. Give all glory to Satan. Give all glory to the demons. And that's not it. It's just, as scripture says, expose the darkness. It's what yeah. it is, exposing the darkness. Satan, the way I see it now is that Satan would love it if you didn't believe in deliverance. Oh, he loves it. He loves it. Why the wouldn't demon, he? The demons love it because they have a cozy home. And if you think, oh, a Christian can't have a demon, then that sucker is going to live on you like a leech for the rest of your life because if you don't call it out in jesus name it's gonna stay there like what are those people called when they like hide in your house 
like squatters squatter yeah. yeah like you got and because you're so prideful or people just have been taught wrong false teaching they've been taught wrong by and and you have these little leeches squatting in your house and it's like yeah it's it, i'm not gonna lie like it can be a freaky thought but wouldn't you rather know you have roaches in your house than like live and like not even know like i have mice then in my house crawling have, in your food and eat them without yeah. Water. yeah and then when you find when you see the first one you're like oh my gosh i have like roaches in my house but like then you can call the exterminator and get them out and be clean like it it's better to to know and get it out than to just live with that nastiness you know so to the that- two young ladies you just heard having their own discussion are Angela Uchi and Taylor Scroggins. These are both young women that are discussing deliverance ministry. And I've had several women within the the past week, actually, and even up till yesterday, reach out to me regarding uh, the things that are being taught by these two young women, uh, the fact that they are ex-New Agers. And some of the women that have reached out to me about this have also come out of the New Age, and they have express concerns about some of the things that are being taught and that it seems as if that there is almost this jumping out of the frying pan and into the fire. That's how I'm going to word it of coming out of the new age and then jumping into some of these other things that are experiential based a lot of times. And I took time to listen to this interview because of some of the concerns that were expressed to me. And even before then, this this video had come up on my radar And I had listened to it because I cover uh, deliverance ministry, as many of you know, when you listen to my podcast, I have different facets of teachings of deliverance ministry, having been someone who was involved in this type of teaching in this movement that I came out of. And so I wanted to talk about this interview today, this discussion that they had because of some of the concerns that were expressed my way from former New Agers, and I'm not an an ex-New Ager, but there is some bleed over, it seems like, when you're seeing deliverance, uh, New Apostolic Reformation, hyper-charismatic movement, that there is some bleed over that you're seeing things in the New Age that are still, that are embraced uh, in these movements. And so there are people coming out of the New Age that are expressing concerns about these types of teachings. And I want to address this because of the things that are being stated in this interview, um, I'm going to be kind and gracious, but I'm going to be firm because there was, quite frankly, there was a lot of misuse of scripture in this interview. And so I want to cover that today. I want to pose some questions as I normally do on my episodes when I'm engaging in some of these topics And we're going to look at a couple of references, one of which, maybe two of them have been ones I previously have referenced, but I'm going to cover a little bit more things in there that I didn't before in other episodes and may touch on some, just a little bit of review. But I want to look at this interview and I want to offer some encouragement for those that have come out of the new age and you're having questions and you're seeing influencers like these two young women that are trying to broach this subject of deliverance ministry. And there is a great appeal to personal experience. There is a misappropriation of scripture. And I want to take a look at that today and offer some input on that and guide you back to scripture and to encourage you once again to open your Bible and read whenever someone references scripture. So I hope that you find this helpful today as we dive into this discussion. Hi there, and welcome to the Love Six Scribe podcast, where we talk about biblical truths, current topics, and where we grow in loving the Word and loving the one who is the Word, Jesus Christ. I am Dawn Hill, and I am the Love Six Scribe. The interview we're going to be looking at today between Angela Uchi and Taylor Scroggins was recorded nine days ago on Angela Uchi's YouTube channel and on her podcast, Heaven and Healing Podcast. And it's an almost uh, hour and a half long. It's it's a little shy of that, about an hour and twenty four minutes. Obviously, we're not going to be looking at every single thing in that interview <laughs> because uh, it just would take too long. So I actually went through and I listened and I took notes. I stopped and I took notes. I opened my Bible whenever a scripture was referenced. Uh, sad to say, when there were scripture references, many of them were not even cited. So unless you've actually, you actually, you have read the Bible and you recognize when certain things are being referenced, then you prob- you may not even catch it. Now, there were a couple times that scripture was referenced, and even then, sad to say, it was not appropriated in the proper context. And this leads to problems, as, I, as I'm going to talk about later, and some concerns with that. 
And, and I share that as someone who spent half my life in the uh, hyper charismatic movement in the new apostolic reformation, believing I was a prophet because I was told I was a prophet, believing I was hearing the voice of God, having dreams and visions, all these experiences that I could certainly try to appeal to. But when I tested many of them against scripture, they did not pass the test of what scripture had to say. And so that had to be the final authority in my life. And it still today is the final authority in my life. That has to be the foundation upon which I stand as scripture. My experiences do not and should not dictate what my understanding of truth is. Because we know that many people, even in false religions and other things, can have experiences, and though they can seem very real, tangible to us, and that we can try to find assurance in those, we ultimately, as believers in Christ, must go back to the foundation of the Word of God in the proper context. So with that being said, uh, I I want to uh, jump into this And again, this is not going to be something that is um, attacking as always. It's always looking at the teaching, never at the person going after the person on an, an individual or private level. This is looking at what is being taught. And so with this being a public teaching there comes public scrutiny, just like with things that I say. It's it's out there for the public to consume, and so people will scrutinize it, and that's their right to do that. So we're going to take a look at this, and I'm going to share some clips with you along the way, just try to give you some uh, summarization of some areas that they did when necessary. There's some things that they touched on that I'm really not going to go into because they appealed to personal experiences as far as Um, drug-related issues in their past and such. So I'm not going to go with there with that. I really want to focus mainly on the things about uh, Scripture that they referenced and what they said about deliverance ministry. So at the beginning of the interview, they began talking about that deliverance is the ministry of Jesus, that it was a third of his ministry. There's a lot of talking points that are set in here that I have heard repetitively from other people that consider themselves demon slayers. And Let me just say this as a side note. Whenever I say that term demon slayer, that's not something I'm calling them. Uh, That's what they call themselves, those that uh, that um, identify as demon slayers. But it just it, it definitely seems that people are wanting to be more than what they are. It's like superhero type level. At any rate, um, this is one of the things that's talked about in deliverance ministry is that a third of Jesus's ministry was casting out demons. And Taylor says that Jesus said deliverance is the children's bread. Now, that's one of the first scriptural references that she mentions. And we've talked about this before. I'm going to put links, as I normally do, to some of the podcasts I've done so that you can hear some of the things that that when I've talked about it. And let me just say this, too. I am not the be all end all. So I'm sure that there are, are far better resources out there that you can also find that talk about this. I would encourage you to look in Bible commentaries, get a good study Bible, make sure that you're studying the word of God in your personal time. So you know what scripture has to say, what other commentaries are are giving you some more input, whether historically and such and interpretive wise that you can get a better understanding of what the passage means. But she is referencing the account with the, the Canaanite woman or the Syrophoenician woman. And this statement has been made many times before about Jesus said that deliverance is the children's bread. This account, just so you know where it's located in scripture, it's an account found in Matthew 15. 15 and Mark 7. And this relays the account of the Canaanite woman or Syrophoenician woman who came to Jesus seeking healing for her daughter who was possessed by a demon. Notice who came for healing and deliverance. It was not the daughter. It was the mother seeking it out for her daughter. And Jesus responded by telling the woman it was not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. The woman in turn responded, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And Jesus acknowledged the woman's faith and healed her daughter. And this account displays the the promise, the glorious promise of salvation first given to the Jewish people and then to the Gentiles. So that phrase, deliverance is a children's bread, that is very common in deliverance ministry. And I would just, again, encourage you, go back to the scripture and what the, what it says in context. I think it's far more powerful than, than the misappropriation that's actually done in this movement, unfortunately. And what's happening, and you'll see this in this interview, and, and this is not an isolated incident, um, and there's other people that do this, but unfortunately, what this type of discussion does 
between these two young women is that it causes confusion, especially for people that are coming out of the new age and coming out of this type of movement. And then they're seeing this go on and seeing deliverance ministry being endorsed and perpetuated and the things that are said that are not found in scripture, the experiences that are talked about in here are not found in scripture. The things that that are talked about, whether in water baptism and such, and, and we'll get there. But I just wanted to to drive that point home. Please open your Bible and read, and please test what someone is saying. And don't be afraid to test it, because we need to be willing to test what is being stated. Taylor goes on to talk about as well, she says, you know, Jesus went into the synagogues, and that was the church at the time, and that he was casting out demons. About five minutes in, she continues, and she references Matthew 12. I want to play a little bit of that for you right now, so you can hear that. Um, and so that is a, it's an extremely important um, ministry to understand, especially in this day and age where you have a lot of people saying deliverance isn't for Christians. Well, the scripture says, Jesus says deliverance is the children's bread. It's for the children of God. It's not for um, the people who are not adopted into his family. And then he he continues and he says, when, when a spirit is cast out of a home, out of a house, he compares our um, bodies to a house. When the spirit is cast out of the home, when it's evicted, it will go and it'll go out and wander in the dry places. When you cast a demon out, it goes and it roams around and it looks for a home and it says, I don't, I don't have anywhere to go. I'll just go back to my old house. I'll just go back to where I was. And it says that the spirit comes back. And if the house is empty, if they're not filled with the Holy Spirit, if they're not following um, the Lord Jesus, that the house is empty, the demon goes and gets seven more spirits, more powerful, and they come and they plunder the house and they take over again. And so if you're not a believer and you're not a Christian and you're not following Jesus, you don't qualify for deliverance because you're going to go right back to the sin. You're going to open up the door of the demons and you're actually going to end up in a worse condition. And that is scripture straight from the book of Mark. We can... We're actually going to look at Matthew. I know she said Mark, but um, we're going to go to Matthew. Matthew 12. That is one of the go-to passages that deliverance ministers like to reference and talking about uh, demons leaving. She's referencing it as that... Uh, Jesus is talking about born again believers here and that when the demon leaves, he goes into dry places and can't find a home. And then he comes back and finds the home that he was in swept, empty and put in order. Are born again believers empty? I've asked this question before and I'm going to ask it again. And again, I'm going to be kind but firm here because this is incorrect teaching. Uh, This is not talking about born again believers. The Holy Spirit had yet to come when Jesus stated this passage. This is not talking about born again believers. And notice who the audience is in Matthew 12, when he talks about this, he's talking to the scribes and Pharisees because they're coming to Jesus and they're saying, teacher, we want to see a sign from you. And he answered and said to them, an evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign and yet no sign will be given to it, but the sign of Jonah, the prophet. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will stand up with this generation at the judgment and will condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise up with this generation at the judgment and will condemn it because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. Now, when the unclean spirit goes out of a man, it passes through waterless places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds it unoccupied, swept and put in order. Then it goes and takes along with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself. And they go in and live there. And the last state of that man becomes worse than the first. That is the way it will also be with this evil generation. Now, earlier in Matthew 12, we know that the Pharisees rebuked Jesus because he cast a demon out of a a blind and mute man, that this is actually referred to as demon possessed in the passage. And we're going to get there because Taylor says something about that, about that we need to understand this in the proper language. And I could not agree more. (laughs) Uh, But she says something that I don't agree with, and there are uh, scholars that do not agree with her on it as well. Nevertheless, Matthew 12 talks about this. You can also go to uh, Luke 11 um, regarding this passage. Again, it's in the context. Please make sure you understand what the context is and who the Pharisees are speaking to, who Jesus is speaking to. The fact this is not referencing a born-again believer. 
He's talking about this this generation in Matthew 12. And I want to read this from BibleRef.com. This is a good website you can go to if you want to look up a Bible verse and and get a, a, a an understanding of what this Bible verse means in the context. So when you look in the context summary here on BibleRef.com for Matthew 12, 43 through 45, it says it contains a warning from Jesus for this evil generation of Israelites who have failed to receive him as Messiah. Jesus describes a demon that has left a person but can find no other home. The demon returns to the person and finds its old house, the formerly possessed person cleaned up and in orderly. The demon invites seven more wicked demons to join it in reoccupying the person, making them worse off than before being freed. Jesus uses this analogy to warn against a similar fate for the people of his era because they rejected him as the Messiah. This is one I've talked about before, um, but I wanted to touch on it again because you're going to hear she kind of does this rapid fire at times like some of these uh, the other deliverance ministers do. You're just firing off different verses. You're not even opening your Bible to see what it says. You're not putting it in the proper context. You're regurgitating something that you've been taught by somebody else in some of these other books, and that's what that is. It's regurgitation of this teaching and deliverance ministry. This is not new teaching. This is stuff that's been around for decades. It's been in Pigs in the Parlor, Derek Prince's books. It's been in a lot of the the deliverance books that you'll read that talk about these different things. Pigs in the Parlor is full of this stuff, full of legal rights and taking scriptures and take and saying things and applying them in a certain way that that's not what the text is saying. So that no, this is actually not talking about a spirit-filled believer. And born-again believers are not empty. And they don't compartmentalize. And this is, <laughs> I'm going to try to, to be to be concise and brief on this. I can be long-winded, and I recognize that in myself. But I just want to, to help you understand. If you're having confusion about what these ladies are saying, it is understandable why you're having confusion, because they sound like they're coming from a place of authority, and they know what they're talking about. And when you misappropriate scripture like this, it does more damage than good, and it's not honoring Christ. So as we go on through their interview and the discussion, um, there is an appeal to personal experience quite often. Um, Taylor talks about about seven and a half minutes in about as a Christian, that something got in her, made her angry, that she had been delivered before of different things. She's an ex-New Ager. And at one point, she says that something got in her and made her angry at deliverance against uh, when someone was coming against yoga and, and the gods of yoga. And she says that something in her her rose up and that she was a Christian. So she's appealing to the fact of saying, well, I was a born again believer, but something else was in me that was talking and coming out and getting angry. So where did the Holy Spirit go? I mean, that's another question. As I sit here and listen to these types of interviews, whether from these two women or from other people, these are questions that I begin thinking about and thinking biblically. And you are going to hear something a little later that Angela says, that it almost seems like that that uh, your critical thinking or your your mind is diminished um, to a certain capacity. Now, I will say this: at the very beginning, she makes a very short clip for this interview and in saying, you know, this was the, an interview talking about deliverance ministry and in a previous interview that they did or discussion. Um, Taylor gives her testimony of coming out of the New Age. And what Angela says is there are some things that we could have said differently or said better, um, but that she doesn't, you know, want them to to be raked over the coals basically because of these things. Well, there's a lot of stuff in here that shouldn't have been said at all, um, quite frankly, because it's not honoring the word of God. It's not bearing witness with the truth of the word of God. And my concern for these women, not only are they influencing a lot of people in in a wrong way and leading them down a deceptive path, but they are also being deceived themselves. And I do, and I equate it to out of the frying pan into the fire, going from one deception to the next, being biblically illiterate. And I say that not as someone that's, that's throwing stones. I'm saying that as someone who myself, I was biblically illiterate. When I was in the movement of being believing I was a prophet and in this type of movement of believing that born again believers can have indwelling demons and some of the things that I believed, I was biblically illiterate and the gospel was not being ministered. It was not being proclaimed. 
So I, I just want to say that um, with with loving kindness and firmness as as a woman who was in this type of belief system with deliverance ministry and and these things, the Bible is sufficient. Christ is sufficient. Now, I know that there's some things in this interview that are stated like that, but when you're telling people that are professing believers that they need demons cast out of them, um, then you are undermining the sufficiency of Christ. And furthermore, salvation from the wrath of God from the penalty of our sin, that is deliverance. That is deliverance. And what Christ has done is sufficient. We are justified. We're, we're delivered from the penalty of sin. We are no longer under the tyranny of Satan as born again believers. We are citizens of heaven now. We live in a now and not yet. We are in this world, but yet at the same time, there is a future promised us that we are already seated in heavenly places with Christ in Ephesians 2. And again, that's been misappropriated in the hypercharismatic NAR movement. To me, it's an overrealized eschatology a lot of times and overrealized uh, a power and authority, and people want to camp out on that. But we live in a now and not yet. So born again believers are justified, we're, we've, we're sanctified, we've been delivered from the, the power of sin. Praise be to God, we have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us who is not compartmentalizing. He cares about, God cares about the whole person. So this is not a meat suit that we're in. That was also referenced. So I'm probably going to have to jump ahead just so I don't make this hours on hours on hours <laughs> of this episode. But referencing the body as just like a meat suit, that's Gnosticism. Whether they realize that or not, when you refer to your body uh, almost like a throwaway in a, in a way, whether intentional or unintentional, your body matters because you're going to have a glorified body. So this is not just a meat suit. It matters what I do in my body. It matters what you do in your body. And, and Gnostics would cross that line of saying, well, it doesn't really matter what you do because everything in this world is evil anyway. What really matters is you ascending in the spirit and you getting secret knowledge and ascending spiritually. I don't know if, that's, if, if they believe any of those things, but when you allude to some of those things when you say that, that's problematic. So Taylor talks about that, about something coming out of her uh, while she's still a Christian. That does not agree with Scripture. I'm sorry. It, it just doesn't agree with Scripture. When you see the accounts in Scripture, you see nothing in there of a born-again, spirit-filled. And let me say, spirit-filled does not mean speaking in tongues. Spirit-filled means a born-again believer at the moment of salvation, the Holy Spirit comes to indwell. There's nothing that we do that that we manifest in such a way that it's a horrible word to use but there's nothing that we demonstrate as far as that's concerned of saying this is how we know that we're spirit-filled is that we speak in tongues that's not the marker of a born-again believer believers are spirit-filled because the holy spirit indwells them and I've done an episode on this too. So I'm sorry that I'm I'm kind of taking rabbit trails with this. I'm going to try to be more concise and and look at the main points here. So they talk about this, they talk about demonic entrance that is the uh, and that's the same as other deliverance teachers about legal rights, um, talking about having uh, cracks in your doors to get in. And th this type of teaching does not lead to freedom, y'all. If you have to constantly worry about a crack in your door as a born again believer, then what hope do you have in Christ? Because you still have a sinful nature to contend with. And we'll get to that in just a little bit. A sinful nature, you still have a sinful nature to contend with, even as a, as a believer. And at one point, uh, Angela says that she now disagrees with being labeled as, as a sinner after salvation. Uh, Taylor says that when the Holy Spirit falls upon a demon, it manifests and you need Jesus. Well, where is the Holy Spirit with respect to the believers then? And and I and I've and I've heard them try to they're trying to honor the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, while they're talking. I understand that, but there's there is a double mindedness there. There is a, a, going on this conversation when you're saying that that one area, but then you're not acknowledging the true power of the Holy Spirit in a born again believer and what true deliverance is and the power of the gospel. And, and the view that, that people in, the, in this type of movement have in the deliverance ministry, a lot of them hold to the view that the full gospel it, it must have signs, wonders, and casting out demons. Otherwise, it's not the full gospel. 
I would like for them to, to explain then why 1 Corinthians 15 mentions nothing about that. Because Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, what the gospel is. That Jesus died on the cross for our sins in accordance with scripture, that he was buried, and that in three days he rose again in accordance with scripture. That's what it says. It says nothing about working signs and wonders and casting demons out of people. And we must also pay attention to who Jesus is speaking when he tells them to cast out demons. And who had authority? Because it, he didn't say that we have all authority. Jesus said in Matthew 28, he said, all of power and authority has been given to me. Jesus has all authority. And from there, he tells his disciples to go and make disciples of all the nations. And he tells his apostles of Christ what they will do that will basically authenticate their ministry and prove that they are from Christ, that they were sent by Christ. And they laid the foundation. The apostles in the early church laid the foundation, Ephesians 2.20, with Jesus Christ as the chief cornerstone. I mean, uh, there is just so much (laughs) to talk about with this. As I said earlier, Angela Ucci says at one point that she disagrees with being labeled a sinner after salvation. Mm -hmm. We are saints when we come to Jesus. Mm -hmm. We are no longer sinners, Mm -hmm. but I was still identifying as a sinner. Mm -hmm. And so when I would continue to sin, I would say, well, this this is why I need Jesus. I'm just depraved. I'm just innately depraved forever. Um, And it's true. We are innately depraved. And then we come to Jesus. We receive his spirit. And we are made saints before yeah. God. Mm-hmm. And so I was just negating that in, that entire concept of biblical truth. And so mm-hmm. I was just sinning. And yeah. I don't want to say that I was doing all the things I was doing in the new age because I certainly was not. But, you know, when I first got saved, I was really on fire. I actually did cast a demon. I don't know if it was out of me, if it was away, f- just away from me out of my house. But it was the demon that was posing as my grandma. Mm-hmm. So there, there's just one example. I'm not, I didn't play the whole thing, but this is one example of appealing to personal experience when she talks about the, the spirit that came into her home. She disagrees with being labeled a sinner after salvation. So do you still sin after you're born again? Are you no longer sinning uh, in your life? Because if that's a belief that someone holds to, then that goes into sinless perfection, and that's a heretical teaching. So you see how we have to be very careful in what we're saying here. And when you're saying, well, I just don't, I don't acknowledge myself as a sinner any longer. Well, I I understand what you're trying to say, but at the same time, you're both as a believer, you're both saint and sin. You, that sinful nature, because you're in a fallen world, you're not glorified yet. You're still having to contend with that. Read Romans (laughs) seven. If you don't believe that we are not, contending with a sinful nature. And we'll touch on that in just a little bit because Taylor mentions Romans 7, 18. Now, she doesn't mention it by the the passage, but when you go and you you hear what she's saying in that, when you listen to the interview, you'll pick it up and you'll go, oh, yeah, that's in Romans 7, what she's saying. When it says there's no good thing that dwells in my flesh, when Paul says that, uh, again, she's going to tie that to the demonic. Anyway, as these ladies go on, one of the questions that occurred to me when just listening to this part of it, uh, a question I thought was, are they not creating a doctrine that has two kingdoms within a Christian? And wouldn't that make two kingdoms at odds? I mean, if you believe that a born-again believer can have indwelling demons, this is not saying, and this is a false equivocation I hear time and time again out of deliverance ministry. You don't believe in demons. You don't believe in Satan. You don't believe in deliverance. And you believe that, that demons can attach themselves on the outside of people. That's not what anybody, uh, that's not what I believe. I don't know what anybody says about that. That and, and that's a poor argument. I do believe that Satan exists. I don't know how many times I've said this on episodes. I believe that demons exist because scripture says they do. They're fallen angels. I believe that they are still in this world and that they, they tempt people. They uh, lead people astray. And I believe that there is spiritual warfare 
in the sense of the battle is not within, I'm not battling a demon within my body. And when I say that, that does not mean that I am diminishing what true deliverance is. It does not mean I don't believe in demons. It doesn't mean I don't believe in Satan. And it doesn't mean that I have some sort of pathetic view of what being a Christian is. And it doesn't mean that the demons just love me saying that because they're just having a party and attaching themselves to me. There's no freedom in that type of belief system. And that's demeaning. And it's diminishing the true deliverance that Christ brings to born again believers. And I thank God that I don't hold to this type of teaching any longer because all it does is perpetuate bondage in people and it doesn't teach people what sanctification means. And that is grossly missing. Not only is the gospel missing in the deliverance ministry, the true gospel of Jesus Christ, in, in talking about the cross and Christ being crucified. And there's a clip I'm going to play at the end that is ironic and all this. I'm going to play a little clip of it. But it, it, I found it very interesting that, that recently came out that somebody said that's in the deliverance camp uh, because I think that it, it really causes their foundation to crumble with their belief in deliverance ministry. They keep saying over and over again that deliverance is the children's bread, that it's for born again believers only. It's not for unbelievers. Well, somebody from your own camp said something recently that I'm going to play in just a little bit when it's the appropriate time to play it. And I, and I just found it astonishing to hear this being admitted out of one of their own mouths that they would say that. Cause I think then your whole foundation of what you all teach is on faulty ground. It's not based in truth and it's not based in the truth of scripture, but they are creating this, this doctrine of two kingdoms within a believer that is unstable. And there's no peace with, with God in that there's no freedom, true freedom in Christ in that not freedom to sin, but freedom and understanding what sanctification is. The gospel is missing in the deliverance ministry teaching. Sanctification is nowhere to be found in this teaching. People are not being told what it means to to walk in progressive sanctification as a born-again believer, to know what to do when you're faced with the temptations of sin, and to stop saying it's a demon all the time, and to stop equating it to a demon or some sort of spirit or some sort of generational curse or some sort of soul tie or some sort of this or that that you have to do something about that essentially becomes a works-based gospel instead of trusting what Christ did and growing in spiritual maturity, learning what it means to crucify your flesh, learning what it means to, to deal with a sinful nature, learning what it means what true spiritual warfare is according to, to Scripture about being submitted to God, about what it really means to resist the devil, and that he doesn't flee because of you, he flees because of God, because of the one you're submitted to. I mean, the deliverance ministry, and it really has the, uh, the temptation there of inflating somebody's ego so much that they, they think that they're glorifying God, but really they're glorifying themselves. Because they think really highly of themselves and they think that they have all this power and they're big and bad and that they can do all these things to demons and demons are afraid of them. Demons don't fear you. They don't fear me. And I'm okay with that because they fear God. And he is my protector and my shield and my defender. And he's the one that sanctifies me. And he is the one that has made me and has justified me before God the Father. And I don't fear demons, and I don't fear talking about deliverance ministry, even though I no longer believe that this is the type of deliverance ministry that is to born-again believers. I see no freedom, no peace, no joy in this type of teaching, because you have people that are repeatedly coming back, and that tells me something's wrong. Something is wrong with this teaching, and it's a lucrative teaching. Let me just say that as well. All right, I'm going to get off my soapbox. Okay, as we go on, about 20 minutes in, uh, Angela talks about her water baptism uh, that took place in January of 2021. And she goes on to talk about how the demon was drowned out in her water baptism. And during this conversation, Taylor says that when you fast and have an unclean spirit, that demons get agitated and they come to the surface. 
I mean, perhaps this is where Angela is talking about they could have said things differently. I don't know. But there is no scripture where it says that demons are drowned in your water baptism. Romans 6 talks about what the water baptism represents. And um, Taylor has no scripture to back up when it says when you fast and you have an unclean spirit that demons get agitated and come to the surface. Where does it say that in the Bible? It doesn't. I'll just save you some time. There's that. And so apparently there was some sort of demonic manifestation when uh, Angela was water baptized. And this is not an uncommon practice in this type of movement, in this type of belief system. Uh, in fact, there are lots of people that like Torben Sondergaard who will actually promote that demons are cast out at water baptism. I would just encourage you to search the scripture and to find where that's found in scripture, where demons were cast out after a regenerated person was water baptized to demonstrate that they were buried with Christ and alive with Christ. So as they went on into their discussion, Angela makes a a statement of saying that she never asked the Lord or consulted scripture with eyes and a heart willing to be wrong uh, regarding this aspect of deliverance ministry that she actually, um, within the past, uh, up until uh, last year, early this year, she did not believe in deliverance ministry, that people would try to say stuff to her and about it. And so she said, I never asked the Lord or consulted scripture with eyes and a heart willing to be wrong. You have the Holy Spirit. You do not, you don't need to have a demon cast out of you. And again, this is just me going off of what other people are saying. I never actually asked the Lord about it. Wow. I never actually really consulted scriptures with eyes and a heart that was willing to be wrong. Mm. And then I started to do that. I started to just turn my eyes to heaven and say, okay, look, like I'm surrendering to you again. I don't know everything. I don't know what's happening to me. Like, I don't want to do these things. I don't want to, I don't want to binge eat. It makes me miserable. Why do I want to do that? Yeah. Why do I want to smoke weed when I know it's making me stray further from you? Mm Mm-hmm. I had a I had a very demonic experience in, in this very house that we're in. So One as the- she goes on, she's talking about these personal experiences that she's having. I'll just reiterate again, there's not scripture that's used in context in, in this discussion. And if you want to listen to this, I'll be more than happy to provide the original source for this. So that way, if you want to listen to it and, and check what I'm saying, you're welcome to do that. As they go on about 33 minutes in, uh, she says she wants to know the truth, that she's doing all the things. She's going to church, she's fasting, she's praying, she's reading her Bible, nothing's working. And again, I, I appeal to the fact that uh, uh, it's, it's sad to me because there's, again, there's no discipleship of sanctification. There's no understanding of that. And there's a reference in the, their discussion of, well, I guess I just have to suffer. You know, I was just told I just have to suffer in my sin. And when we live in a fallen world, as we do, uh, there are consequences to sin, first and foremost, and there are times that God is gracious and merciful to us, and we don't have the consequences that we deserve from our sin. Uh, there's times that we have consequences, and and it's because of, of what we've done. Um, and either way, we need to recognize God's grace in that and recognize God's process of sanctification in the life of a born-again believer. And that's not always comfortable. It's painful. Um, And there is suffering. I know that people don't like hearing that. And that was something that I really shied away from in in this movement. But people don't want to hear about suffering. And they don't want to believe that because they want God's best life now. And I don't want God's best life now because if this is as good as it's going to get, then you know, then there's not much to look forward to in eternity. And we know that in scripture, that's just not the case, that, that this is not our best life now. Um, understand that I have eternity to look forward to, to be in the presence of God and to worship him and to glorify him and to enjoy him forever. The, what we deal with in this world, it's temporal. It, it's, um, it's transient. So there seems to be in this discussion of making these broad blanketed statements that really are not founded in truth. And, and I don't know who all has said these things to, to them of some of the statements they're making, but they, they seem like straw man arguments really that are being propped up when, when certain statements are made about suffering and, and not believing in demons or being afraid of deliverance ministry. And that's why you don't do it and stuff. I just find that to be straw man arguments. Uh, They refer to scripture, but without open Bibles, without a clear reference. Many times, as I said, I want to play this clip about 37 minutes in uh, when Angela and Taylor are talking about the deliverance that Taylor did on Angela. And I just want you to hear what's said 
And I, I want you to think about this question. Is this seen in scripture in born again believers? And I remember as we're going through it, like I'm thinking to myself, like, this is wild. Like this is, yeah, you were saying that, like, I can't believe this is happening. What is happening? Like, that's not me. Like the way, like these things that are like, that's what was that? What, what is like another voice was coming out of your mouth and then you'd be like, what was that? And I was like, it's okay. Like this is biblical. Like you're getting set free. Mm -hmm. Like, how do you explain that? Like a Christian can't, and literally there's another voice that's literally talking out and then leaving and then you're free. Like what? (laughs) and didn't want to leave and it was crazy and um so this happens in the parking lot for a couple hours i go home angela goes on to say that she had the same feeling she was exhausted after that deliverance session after a few hours with taylor but she said she had the same feeling when she got delivered from tarot cards and crystals so again another appeal to experience the same feeling and they are appealing at the same time to fruit then because there's no binge eating or there's no desire for drugs. Or there's no desire to, to go back to tarot cards and crystals. And that's all well and good, but you still are in a fallen world where those temptations can arise. And the maturity in a born again believer, again, goes back to sanctification and what scripture has to say about when we're faced with temptation. That first of all, God doesn't tempt us. In James 1.13, it talks about that. But also, too, we know what we are to do when we're faced with temptation, that we are to pray and that we are to be watchful and mindful and to understand what God's word says, that is the final authority that we go to. Again, it is not your personal experience that you go to in order to find truth. That's not where you go. It is back to the word of God, rightly divided and understood and applied to your life properly so that you can grow in spiritual maturity and that you can be corrected by God and you can be instructed and that you can have fruit that demonstrates that you belong to Christ. As they go, And as they go, Taylor says that nowhere does it tell us not to cast out demons. And so she's appealing to the Gospels. For example, she doesn't say that, but she's going and she's citing the Gospels of where Jesus says to, to cast out demons. Well, who is he speaking to? And another thing I would point out, as I had before, is why are the epistles silent on this? Now, there are some teachers uh, of this, like Isaiah Saldivar and others, that will say they will they will basically read in to the, the scriptures, and they'll say, well, they were already doing this, so there was no need to correct them on this. Well, where does it say that? How, how do you know that? You're assuming that that's what they did, that the scriptures are... I thought that they were um, sufficient for our instruction. So were the apostles um, lacking in telling that in the epistles to the churches about uh, casting demons out of born again believers about doing deliverance ministry? There's nothing in there of the epistles of this being taught to the churches in that time or to us today. Um, Taylor cites one account of someone casting out demons who was not a disciple that that's referenced several times. And just because that's one particular incident that is not prescriptive, it's descriptive. I, I, again, I would encourage you to do some Bible study on that. There's some good commentaries on that. And she also cites Matthew 12, 25, Mark 3, 24. Again, she doesn't cite them by name, but when you pay attention to the wording that she's using, you immediately go, oh, she's talking about when it says a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. She's talking about these verses. Well, I want to read something that Matthew Henry had to say about those particular verses in Matthew 12, 25. Regarding that particular passage, uh, Matthew Henry noticed, noted this, and, and I think it's interesting to point this out. He said, it was not at all strange or improbable that demons should be cast out by the Spirit of God. How otherwise do your children cast them out? Because in one point, Jesus makes a reference in Matthew 12 to the Pharisees. There, was, there were exorcisms that were taking place in that time. Why people were so in awe of Jesus is because he had such authority. And it talks about this in the gospel of Mark in Mark one, when he cast a demon out of a man in synagogue and they marveled at this teaching because he taught it. He had such power and authority because he was the Messiah. (laughs) That's why. And so there were exorcisms going on with people doing incantations. The Jewish people were doing incantations and doing this sort of ritualistic formulaic way of casting demons out. And Jesus brings it to their attention. He says, if Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. And that, how then will his kingdom stand? And 
And then he says, if I, if I by Beelzebub cast out demons, by whom do your sons cast them out? For this reason, they will be your judges. And Matthew Henry says, how otherwise do your children cast them out? There were those among the Jews who by invocation of the name of the most high God or the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob did sometimes cast out devils. Josephus speaks of some in his time that did it. We read of Jewish exorcists and of some that in Christ's name cast out devils, though they did not follow him. These the Pharisees condemned not, but imputed what they did to the spirit of God. It was therefore merely from spite and envy to Christ that they would own that others cast out devils by the spirit of God, but suggest that he did it by compact with Beelzebub. The judgments of envy are made not by reason, but prejudice. Matthew Henry goes on to say this casting out of devils was a certain token and indication of the approach and appearance of the kingdom of God. But if it be indeed that I cast out devils by the spirit of God, the kingdom of the Messiah is now about to be set up among you. And that's what Jesus told them. Other miracles, Matthew Henry says that Christ wrought proved him sent of God, but this proved him sin of God to destroy the devil's kingdom and his works. The destruction of the devil's power is wrought by the spirit of God. If the devil's interest in a soul be sunk and broken by the spirit of God as a sanctifier, no doubt, but the kingdom of God has come to that soul, the kingdom of grace, a blessed earnest of the kingdom of the glory. So my friend, uh, what, what the Holy Spirit does in a born again believer is sufficient. It is sufficient, and and the Word of God is sufficient in helping us understand this. And these references that are being made to this in saying, well, you know, Jesus said we're to cast out demons. There's no scripture that says that we're not supposed to cast out demons. There's no scripture in the Bible that instructs to cast demons out of born-again, spirit-filled believers. That's the rub right there. That's the sticking point. If you want to say that scripture says, okay, we're to cast out demons— well, find the passages that specifically point out where born again, spirit filled, Holy Spirit filled believers had demons cast out of them. Show us passages where someone was indwelt with the Holy Spirit and they had demons talking out of their body while they were indwelt with the Holy Spirit. The, the burden is not on us to show that. If you're going to, to claim that deliverance ministry Casting demons out of born again believers is for is for Christians only. Then the burden of proof is on you to show those passages and to not twist them and misappropriate them to say something they do not ever say or mean. As they go on, they say two more deliverance moments that um, that uh, Angela felt she felt true freedom that day. So even then, 40 minutes in, you're hearing her re recount different stories of her saying that she was claiming to be delivered, but it was a progressive deliverance from, from demons. And again, this is not talking about sanctification because there are no passages in the New Testament that are, that are prescriptively telling believers to cast demons out of themselves. Self-deliverance is an oxymoron, as I said before. You, can, you are not your own deliverer. And the, I understand that there will be uh, semantics played and, and gymnastics, word gymnastics, and doctrine gymnastics played in the deliverance ministry to say, well, we don't believe that. We believe Jesus said, well, when you say self-deliverance, you're implying that you're delivering yourself, that you are your own savior. I can't save myself. If I do, I am perishing. I am in despair. I need Christ. I need him daily. And thank God the Holy Spirit dwells within me. And thank God I don't have to worry about having these deliverance sessions with these people that are just taking advantage of people and they're deceiving people continuously. And they're not leading them back to the truth of the word of God. And they talk about Jesus is so enough. Jesus is so enough. So my question is, with the belief that Jesus is enough, why is the Holy Spirit not sufficient in deliverance ministry to keep a demon from physically indwelling a born again believer? That seems to be a problem. Taylor references Isaiah 53. She reads Isaiah 53, and she's going to go in and launch into this about that uh, healing has to be applied and deliverance has to be applied as a believer. And that's works-based because she's reading in Isaiah 53 and uh, seeing that this is a prophetic word about the Messiah that would come. And 1 Peter 2, 24 and 25 recognizes this. Uh, Peter references Isaiah 53. Uh, that by his stripes we were healed. This is talking about sinful sin sickness. This is not talking about physical physical sickness in your body. 
We're not all promised healing on this earth. We're not promised perfect, per- perfect healing in this body. Yes, we have that per se in the atonement in eternity where we'll, there will be no more sickness. There'll be no more sin. There will be no more sorrow, but we don't have that promise right now. And so to tell someone, well, you just need to apply healing. You just need to apply deliverance. That's works-based. That's not trusting in what Christ did for you. And that's not trusting that perhaps that God would use sickness in your life to sanctify you, that he would use it for his glory. But that is not a popular message. And we don't like, none of us like hearing that because suffering is not something that's looked upon as being a blessing. It doesn't, it's not looked upon as being something that draws you closer to God. Let me, let me just tell you something. If you want to talk about personal experience and understanding it in light of scripture, I can tell you as a, as a wife over the past few years and seeing my husband have MS that there has been some trying times that have come with that. And with that comes the understanding more every day. God uses everything for his glory and for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. And what I may not see as good, God sees it as good when it's used to sanctify and to kill things daily that need to die in the life of a born again believer. That's if I'm going to rest on my quote experience in something when I take it back to the word of God when I ask God to help me to be a godly wife and a godly mother because I fall short daily and my family will tell you (laughs) I fall short daily and it's not because I need a demon cast out of me or anything like that it's because of my understanding I need Christ daily I don't need self-deliverance and I don't need to cough anything out or throw up anything or renounce and, and confess and to repeat with uh, repetitive, uh, with vain repetition, which the Bible for, tells us not to do. Jesus tells his believers not to pray in vain repetition. There are things that we are told not to do in scripture and we're to trust in the Lord, uh, re- have our minds renewed by the word of God. We're to stand firm in spiritual warfare. To have the armor of God put on, which is not something that you have to do every day, by the way. You don't wake up and you have to say out of your mouth, I put on the breastplate of righteousness. I put on the helmet of salvation. I do this and do that. It tells us to stand firm. You're, you're clothed spiritually in Christ. That's All of it's pointing back to Christ. All this, the armor of God's pointing back to Christ in Ephesians 6. And then you're told to stand firm. Stand firm. Pray. Supplicate. But unfortunately... There is a mindset that we want to be the hero and we want, to, we want to be legends in our own minds and to be the hero of our lives, something that the demon fears. Put your trust in Christ, my friend. Go back to Christ. Recognize that you are weak and that your strength is found in him. And it's not about you being a superhero or being a demon slayer or anything else. It's about growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, And making sure that our conduct is worthy of the gospel of Christ and growing in spiritual maturity. And that doesn't look exciting all the time. Sometimes it looks pretty boring in our understanding and our capacity. And it also looks like taking accountability for our sinful nature and stop trying to put a devil on top of it. Uh, Taylor goes on to to cite Acts 8 about Philip and... um, This is another verse that's used. I I won't go into all these for time's sake. I will mention them. Please take time to to read them in context. But um, several of these deliverance ministers will go and they'll cite Acts 8 where Philip goes into Samaria and he's ministering. And they'll try to basically say that those that had demons cast out of them were born again believers. The verse does, the passages do not say that. So I would just read them in context. It doesn't say that he was casting demons out of Christians. That's, That's being read into the passage. It does not say that. For about 47 minutes in, Angela says that you don't have to be ashamed of Jesus' healings, miracles, or deliverance. And, and that's, again, that's another statement that's being made. So anybody who says anything about deliverance, apparently, is being ashamed of what Jesus did. No, actually, I'm not ashamed. I am not ashamed. Salvation is deliverance. And Romans 1, 16, 17 tells us I, that Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of salvation. To all who will believe, the Jew first and then the Greek. That is the power. The gospel is the power of salvation. And I am not ashamed of that. And it is sufficient for me. 
I don't need anything beyond that to know that I am born again and that I am going to spend my eternity with God. And whatever this life holds and whatever God permits to happen, because he is sovereign, by the way, and he is sovereign over what he allows Satan to do, and he is sovereign over everything that happens in this world. He is sovereign. Nothing is hidden from him. Nothing is kept out of his sight. And that is comforting to know, and it is very uh, convicting at the same time. Because as a born-again believer, I realize nothing's hidden from God. And as a believer, when I know that I sin and fall short of His glory, that I can come before His throne of grace with confidence because of Christ, not because of myself, because of Him. And thank God for His grace and His mercy. Not grace to abound so I can sin more, The grace to know I am a sinner and a saint and I am in need of him desperately daily and I am not yet perfected and not yet glorified. And I don't know about you, but I still think that that's good news. Now, I did play a clip earlier where um, they were talking back and forth about 49 minutes in. I'm just giving you these timestamps so you know where to go to to check what I'm saying because I want to be accountable to what I'm saying. Where Taylor makes a comment and says that Satan loves it when you don't believe in deliverance. Again, it's like a pot shot. So I find it interesting when listening to this conversation that uh, at one point they'll say, well, it shouldn't matter if you believe in deliverance or not. It's not a salvation issue and that it shouldn't be a big deal. But then they'll say things like this. Well, Satan loves it when you don't believe in deliverance because then he'll attach himself to you. And and then you have roaches in your house. Why why wouldn't you want to know that you have roaches in your house? Why are you calling the the temple of God a roach infested house? Why are you doing that? He cleanses us from unrighteousness. The Holy Spirit dwells in this temple. First Corinthians six. This is the temple of God. Why would a demon be permitted to cohabit in the temple of God that has been purchased with his own blood? As they went on about 50 minutes in, Angela poses this question to Taylor saying, well, what do you do with people that say that the Holy Spirit would not live with an unclean spirit? Let's hear Taylor's response to this question. So to that point, what do you say to people that that say that the Holy Spirit would never live somewhere that an unclean spirit has access to? Yeah, well, we know that God is omnipresent and he's everywhere, right? And also the Bible says that no good thing dwells in our flesh. So if our flesh is fallen and sinful, but the Holy Spirit lives in us. In our and he, spirit. Yeah. And so um, he's in our spirit. We have flesh. And when we have a demon, the demon um, is in the soul, right? So the Bible, we're, we're also triune beings. Like you have are made in God's image, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We are body, soul, and spirit. Um, and so the Holy Spirit dwells in the spirit, our flesh these meat suits, and then your your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. And think about that. Where does the devil attack you? Your emotions, your mind, your thought life, your cravings, your sins, your appetite, your personality. That's where um, these unclean spirits will attack you. And I th- honestly, it's great news to hear that you don't have to live with depression your whole life. You don't have to live with a eating disorder. You don't have to live with anxiety. You don't have to live with addiction. You don't have to live with this your whole life and say, well, I'm just a sinner. I just have to live in this misery and in this bondage and just wait till I get called home to heaven. It's like crucify you can, ha- yeah. And, and we do have to crucify the flesh, but the Christians, too many Christians are trying to crucify demons, thinking that it's their flesh instead of casting them out. Like you got to crucify the flesh. So I don't, know if you catch this when when deliverance ministers say this but they will basically say well not everything's a demon or they'll they'll say well you got to crucify the flesh but you also have to realize that you're allowing demons to come in you give them legal rights uh they'll they'll equate one with the other and we see in passages of scripture we see in galatians 5 we see um in romans we see in numerous passages where there is a con- consistent call from the apostles to not gratify the desires of the flesh. And I know Taylor at one point even said, uh, well, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's sins of the flesh that are listed, but at some point, like addictions and stuff, they become basically demonic. Well, scripture doesn't say that. They are equated as gratifying the desires of the flesh. There is, again, a reading into the passage of saying, well, this is demonic and that you need a demon cast out. It does not say that. We are told over and over uh, and reiterated about putting on Christ, 
putting under the desires of the flesh and focusing on Christ, focusing on the power of God working within you that is by the Spirit of God to continue to conform you to the image of Christ, that this is a daily process. And I think it's better news for a born-again believer to hear, I have great hope to look forward to in eternity. That yes, there are things that are going to happen in this world, and I don't, I, I'm no longer under the power of sin because of Christ. See, deliverance ministry still gives power to demons. And whether, and I know that they don't like hear, hearing that, but it does. They'll try to refute it and try to rebut it, but you are giving power to demons. You're not acknowledging what Jesus did as far as sanctification is concerned. Read 1 Peter 2.24, because it also talks about, as I've mentioned before, that it's, it's also referencing not only our justification before Christ, but our sanctification in Christ. 1 Peter 2.24 uh, states, and he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness for by his wounds, you were healed. That is not a physical healing. As I've said before, that is spiritual healing. That is from sin sickness. So we've been delivered as believers. If you're a believer, you've been delivered from the power of sin in your life. And this is where sanctification comes in. This is not talked about. So it actually gives power back to Satan when you keep saying this. If anybody comes and they have an issue, if they have a lust issue, if they have a pride issue, an anger issue, if they um, are are grieving and, and they can't stop getting over this loss, then all of it is equated to a demon and it gives power to the demonic. When over and over and over in scripture, we are told, put on Christ, don't gratify the desires of the flesh, trust of the flesh, trust in the Lord, put your hope in Christ, look to what is eternal, not to what is transient in this world. We are told over and over and over in scripture, we are instructed to where we're supposed to go. She makes the case of saying God is omnipresent and there is truth that God is omnipresent But there is a paradox there in the sense that he is not dwelling in in unbelievers. So her case for saying that is wrong. Believers do not have God's presence dwelling within them. But yet he is still omnipresent. And that is something that is an attribute of God. And that is something that we do not understand in our finite minds what that means. But there is nowhere in scripture where it supports the teaching that a Holy Spirit filled believer, born again believer, will cohabit with a demon within the, the temple of God. Uh, Proverbs fifteen twenty nine it says, he is uh, far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. So something to think about there. And she referenced Romans seven eighteen with no good thing dwells in our flesh. Please read your Bible. Uh, I'm going to go to Logos real briefly just to touch on this. Because when you actually look up the word flesh, because she points to her physical flesh is that. But that's not what that word means there. That word means uh, flesh there as sinful humanity. That's what it means in Romans 7, 18. When you look that up and you look on Logos at that Greek word there, it actually means sinful humanity. It's not your physical body. It's talking about that sinful nature. Even in some translations, it, it talks about that's the, your sinful nature. There is nothing good that dwells within my sinful nature. And Paul is talking in the present tense in Romans 7, and he's laying out this war, this battle that goes on between that the, the things of, of the spirit are hostile to the things of the flesh and vice versa, because the flesh, the flesh is hostile to God. It doesn't want to submit. And this is where the spirit comes in. This is where sanctification comes in. This is where we acknowledge, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Christ will deliver you. Read Romans 7. For goodness sake, read Romans 7. Um, These ladies continue to go on and they say, you know, she talks about the tripart being. Uh, I would just like to say that she gives zero scripture to verify that demons reside in the soul of a believer. There's, we don't see in scripture where it specifically says the soul is the mind, will, and emotions. And by the way, this is someone who was, who came from word of faith teaching, hyper charismatic. And I taught this stuff and I believed it. I taught about the tripart being in our local church at times when I was, when I was permitted to do that. And I was taught that as well for years. And that is a word of faith teaching with the tripart being the soul is the mind, will, and emotions. And deliverance ministers, you have adopted word of faith teaching in order to get around this whole thing of the tripart being and saying that demons dwell in the soul and in the flesh. 
And scripture doesn't say, doesn't say that. You already heard her say that, you know, she wouldn't go to a church that didn't do deliverance because it's basically a demon daycare. Um, there's certain little statements like this that they may sound like a mic drop, but really it's a mic mute, like the, the mic need to be muted at that moment because these types of comments really are not fruitful. They're not fruitful and they're not based in truth. Um, Angela makes a point about an hour in to say that you need to allow the Holy Spirit to do what he does. And I don't allow God to do anything. Let me just say that. We don't allow God to do anything. And, and the belief that we have to allow God to do something means that we don't understand who God is and who we are. And and again, I say that as someone who used to say things like this. Uh, but if you believe that you have to give God permission to do something, then you don't, you're not speaking of the God of the Bible. She basically said that she had a supernatural experience and you are not saved intellectually. You are not saved intellectually. I, I would just encourage you to read Romans 10. Romans 10 is appealing to the fact that your mind, your whole being is, is coming to understand who Jesus is. It's not about you having some experience where you fall on the floor and you're, uh, and you're emotionally experiencing something. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. And your mind is involved in that, by the way. Salvation, it does not bypass your intellect. Because you have to comprehend what the word of God is saying. And yes, it is on a heart level because your heart is changed by God. You are, you are transformed. You are a new creation. The old has passed away. The new has come. Second Corinthians 521. Absolutely. But I, it really is frustrating to hear people downplay in intellect and to basically diminish that. And what you're doing is you're telling people, don't use critical thinking, shut your mind off because it has nothing. Again, that's almost borderline Gnostic teaching that your mind has nothing to do with you being saved. I beg to differ. You have to hear the gospel preached and your mind comprehends it and your heart is changed. How will they hear unless someone is sent? Your mind, your intellect is involved in that. I, you come, let us reason. Isaiah says, "Come, let us reason." Paul went in the book of Acts. It talks about that he reasoned with people among the scriptures. I'm sorry, Angela, what you just said was incorrect and it's unbiblical. It doesn't match up with the the testimony of of the Word of God. People need their brains in order to comprehend what the word is saying, but it does. And at the same time, I do agree in the sense that she said it does change your heart. There is a true transformation and it is supernatural. Salvation is supernatural. A person that was spiritually dead is brought being is, is being brought to spiritual life. But to say that your intellect isn't involved, that, that does not match up with scripture. Um, they, they talk about that most demons enter through childhood traumas. Taylor talks about this. Again, this is an old teaching in the deliverance ministry. There's no basis to, to a scriptural truth in this. This is all just continuous regurgitation of, of the deliverance ministry teaching. She says all the devil needs is a crack in the door. Um, how is this freedom and how does this lead to spiritual maturity? That's the question I would ask. She says you can cast out the strong man first and then you can cast out lower ranking demons. This is pigs in the parlor talk. I've, I've read this before in, in that book and in others. Um, so there's that. She talks about legal rights. She talks about giving the enemy a foothold. They both did that. I believe that's in Ephesians. Please that again, I've, I feel like I beat a dead horse with this with these verses, but these are a lot of the go-to verses that deliverance ministers go to. That's not what that's saying. It's not a physical location. That's talking about giving an opportunity when you actually look at that word. Uh, they mention having a demon and that the Bible doesn't say demon possessed and that it is a silly argument over words and that we need to get back to the original language. And I want to reference this article once again. I did this a while back on another episode, but this is a, a really good article by Robert Dean Jr. Uh, titled Demon Possession and the Christian. And he gives the historical developments with this about the neo-spiritual warfare, about some of the authors that wrote about uh, some of these things. But further on into the article, uh, Robert Dean makes these observations. First of all, he says, experience must be interpreted by the word of God. The word of God should not be interpreted through experience. And he references Psalm 36, 9, Psalm 119, 105, and Isaiah 8, 20. 
As he goes on, he gives some examples of biblical demon possession, and then he talks about the meaning of the word uh, diamonizomai. And he says it is a participle form of the more commonly used noun for demon. Scholars usually translate demon diamonizomai to be possessed by a demon, or when it is used to describe a person in that condition, it is rendered demoniac. And the word is used 13 times all in the Gospels. He says it is increasingly popular to dilute the meaning of this word by translating it as demonized. So the fact that Taylor is telling people that that's not what that word means, it doesn't mean demon possessed, um, she's incorrect because that's not what scholars actually say. When you look at, at it in BDAG, which is the gold standard for a, a Greek lexicon, it says possessed, demon possessed. Robert Dean says, since no systematic definition is given in the Bible for demon possession, the best way to define the term is to examine the characteristics in the biblical examples that define for us these words. From these two basic terms, we see that someone demonized or who is said to have a demon is a person who has one or more demons dwelling within him. The demons have taken up residence inside the body, not inside the soul or spirit. Some writers seek to make a distinction. The demon indwells the soul, but the spirit is indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Unfortunately, no biblical evidence for this exists. If our information about demon possession was limited to the term diamonizomai, then it might be legitimate to conclude that there is merely a generic term describing some sort of demon activity in relation to human beings. And as he goes on in this, he he elaborates on that a little bit. And then near the end of that, he says the lexical methodology of these advocates for this teaching commits the fallacy of defining a word based on its root meanings or etymology rather than on how the word is actually used and defined in context. Demonized and to have a demon are used in scripture of only one extreme type of demonic activity. To have one or more demons taking up residence inside the body of a person and exercising control by overriding the individual's volition in relation to their bodily functions. The person's soul, his identity is still there, though suppressed. His volition to believe or reject the gospel must therefore still be there. However, the ability to control his body is not. And he does uh, make a reference. He also goes on to say later, since the major feature here is control, we must ask if possess is an adequate English term to convey this meaning. According to one group, possess is inadequate because it conveys the idea of ownership, which is one of several meanings for the noun. However, the Oxford English Dictionary lists as the first meaning of the verb possess, quote, of a person or body of persons to hold, occupy a place or territory, to reside or be stationed in, to inhabit with or without ownership. This primary meaning for possess clearly accords with the evidence of the biblical events. Therefore, the case for rejecting demon possess as an accurate translation of the Greek diamonizomai is without support in either Greek or English lexica or the biblical usage of the term itself. And one other thing I wanted to read from him, he says, by rejecting the historically accepted definition of demon possession and reducing it to nothing more than an extreme form of demon influence, that author is then able to say that Christians can be demon possessed and thereby justify so-called deliverance ministries and exorcisms of believers. And he goes on in this article. It's really good. I encourage you to read it. I'll make a point to put a link to it in the description below. Six arguments against demon possession of a Christian. Now, I know these people will say that they don't believe that that Christians can be demon possessed. But as I've stated before in other episodes, what they're describing and what they show on their videos is what is seen in biblical accounts of someone who is demon possessed. When people are writhing on the floor and they're screaming and another voice comes out of them, then I would, I would lovingly say you need to test yourself to see if you're even in the faith according to 2 Corinthians 13 because if you're saying that a, a, you're a born again believer and that another voice is coming out of you that is a demon you're describing biblical accounts and scripture of someone who was not indwelt by the Holy Spirit and was possessed it, uh, yes words do matter <laughs> we need to get back to the original language and this is a dilution of the, the meaning of this word Now, as we're closing here, I I did touch on some of these things, and I wanted to play one one clip for you that was not in this interview. And as I said before, I wanted to play this for you because I, I think that this is very important. But I just wanted to say these things real quickly. There are issues here. There are issues with biblical illiteracy, not having a proper understanding of sanctification. There is an appeal to experience, and I don't see how that's any different 
than new age or any other thing for that matter when you're appealing to experience as as the foundation of truth as the foundation of truth as a believer in christ yes we will have experiences that doesn't mean that we're robots but our experiences cannot be the foundation upon which we rest Because if we're always basing the truth on our experience and we filter the truth on our experience, we're going to be led astray and be deceived. So we cannot appeal to experiences for the sake of this is the truth. It happened to me and therefore it must be true. That's a dangerous path to go down. And I have been down that path in this movement and it and it is deceptive the fruit, what is the fruit of a believer's life? They, they talked about that, and I appreciate them wanting to talk about the fruit of a person's life. But the fruit is demonstrated in the true transformation that only can be brought by the power of God and, and uh, obeying his, the word of God. The, the fruit of our life, the fruit of the Spirit, is found by the power of the Holy Spirit working in the life of a believer. And we can only walk in the ways of God by reading the word of God and obeying. That's the fruit of a person's life is obedience. That's not salvation. Obedience is the fruit of a life of a believer. Uh, They talked about renouncing and what open doors are, uh, breaking soul ties and curses and and, uh, back to Adam and Eve. And um, I just have to ask this question, how many times does one have to do this until they are free? Because this just seems to be an ongoing thing. There's no true freedom in this. And then also saying, well, I don't do these things any longer. Well, praise God. Praise God for that. But acknowledge that that's not the power in and of yourself that's done that. If you're truly not tempted by those things any longer, and I believe that God can deliver us from uh, certain things supernaturally. I do believe that God does things supernaturally. And I, and I reject the, the uh, rhetoric of, well, you don't believe how we believe in deliverance ministry, so you don't believe that God does anything, anything supernatural. That could not be further from the truth. God does things supernaturally. The problem is, is that with us is that we want to equate everything in, in that capacity and then go beyond the bounds of scripture in order to have an understanding of things. And again, that gets into dangerous territory. Now, I, I said that there was a clip I want to play, and this is one of the things I want to end with. And I was, again, I was quite shocked to hear some of the things that were said in this. I'm not going to play the whole thing, but I do want you to hear something that Alexander Pagani said recently, because he talked uh, specifically in a clip that he had on his channel and stated about how um, deliverance ministers are not preaching the gospel. And he even said that about himself. He said, we're not preaching Christ. We're not preaching Christ. It's that Christ is implied in what we do, but that there's no preaching of the gospel. There's no preaching of Christ crucified. And though I appreciate him saying that, uh, time will tell if, if uh, the, and the fruit <laughs> of, of saying something like that, time will tell if that is um, really what he believes in that. I, I hope that he does. But I wanted to play this real quick. He also said this uh, in that clip that he shared. And I think that it's important to share when you're talking about deliverance ministry. And uh, again, I think it it uh, attacks their own foundation of their very teaching in what they say about deliverance ministry. I got to be honest, as a general to this thing, I throw myself in there. We're not talking about Christ. Christ is implied. Christ is implied. Christ is in our motive. Baby, how are they going to hear unless there's a preacher? Romans chapter 10. We need to present the centrality of the gospel. Why? Because half these people coming for deliverance are not born again. My God. Let me say it again. Half of these people in our videos are not born again. They're just needy people that need freedom and we're going to help them. But have we ever considered... Have these people coming for deliverance, have they heard a clear presentation of the, of the gospel? And to that I would say, 
Yes, I would. I would second that question. And that's a question that I've asked numerous times. And other people have asked this question. But did you hear what he said? I don't know how many times I have I've listened to deliverance teachings. And I've heard this same teaching over and over that deliverance is the children's bread and that deliverance is for born again believers. And he just admitted that at least I would say it's more than that. At least half of these people coming for deliverance are not believers. This is a problem for you all in the deliverance camp. You're teaching something and saying it's for ch- for Christians but then you're acknowledging that many of these people are not born again believers. You have a major problem on your hands. And the answer is the gospel, the pure, unadulterated gospel that is only found in the word of God. Please return to that. And with that, I'm going to end our time for today. And I hope that you've found this podcast helpful. I will have links in the bottom, including to the original discussion so that you can go back and, and check what I'm saying and hold me accountable and that you can hear what they said and that you can test what they're saying in accordance with scripture for yourself. Until next time, when we discuss another topic, be blessed today by the truth of God's word. Thanks for joining me on this podcast. If you would like to connect with me, you can find me on Facebook and Instagram. You can also email me at dawn at lovesubscribe.com. If you've enjoyed this podcast, I hope you'll consider leaving a five-star review and that you'll even share it with others who may benefit from the information provided. If you also like reading, you can subscribe to my blog at lovesubscribe.com, where I release weekly blogs that correlate with the podcast episodes. I've enjoyed our time together today, and I look forward to our next time together as we dive into biblical truths, current topics, and where we grow in loving the Word and loving the one who is the Word, Jesus Christ. Blessings to you.